Hi once again, this is Clifford de la Cruz, your teacher in the subject of the contemporary world. In the previous lesson, I talked about the economic globalization or the global economy. As a reminder, economics is just one window into the phenomenon of globalization. It is not the entire thing. However, globalization is anchored on the changes of the economy. Global culture, for example, is facilitated by trade. Filipinos, tayo, hindi sana tayo magiging aware sa mga product ng American, sa mga movies nila, sa mga music nila, if not for trade, as well as the globalization in politics. So it's not the entire thing. In this video, we are going to talk about the Bretton Woods system, the neoliberalism, and the economic globalization of today. So bago ang lahat, nais ko munang humingi ng pasensya kasi may ingay sa background, mayroong manok. So ituloy natin, so what is Bretton Woods system? What is the significant contribution of Bretton Woods system in the process of globalization? So Bretton Woods system was inaugurated in 1944 during the United Nations Monetary and Financial Conference to prevent the catastrophes of the early decades of the century from reoccurring and affecting international ties. After the two world wars, the world leaders sought to create a global economic system that would ensure long-lasting peace. In order to prevent another war, they had the Bretton Woods system. This system was largely influenced by the ideas of British economist John Maynard Keynes, who believed that economic crises occur not when a country does not have money, but when money is not being spent and thereby not moving. Sabi ni Paring Keynes, magkakaroon ng crisis ang isang bansa, hindi dahil sa wala silang pera, kundi dahil hindi ito nagagastos or hindi ito napapaikot ng mabuti. That's according to this economist. When economies slow down, according to Keynes, governments have to reinvigorate markets with infusion of capital. So, reinvigorate meaning to, to liven up, to, to encourage these markets. To this active role of government in managing spending serves as anchor for what would be called a system of global Keynesianism. Sa Bretton Woods system, merong dalawang financial institutions na nabuo. Ano yun? We have the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development or the World Bank. It is responsible for funding post-war reconstruction projects. Next, we also have the International Monetary Fund, the global lender of last resort to prevent individual countries from spiraling into credit crisis. If economic growth is slowed down because there was not enough money to stimulate the economy, that's where the IMF steps in. So ngayon, ang IMF at World Bank, they remain key players in the economic globalization. Shortly after the Bretton Woods system, it was inaugurated in 1944, right? In 1947, various countries committed themselves to further economic integration. Ano yung ginawa nila? The GATT or the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade in 1947. Its main purpose was to reduce tariffs and other hindrances to free trade or yung mga tinatawag natin na trade barriers. Bago tayo pumunta sa neoliberalism, tingnan muna natin natin yung global Kenyanism. So global Kenyanism came in the mid 1940s to the early 1970s. During this period, governments poured money into their economies, allowing people to purchase more goods and in the process, the demand of their products also increased. As demand increased, so did the prices. The theory went that as prices increased, companies would earn more and would have more money to hire workers. Kenyan economists believe that all this was a necessary trade-off for economic development. And that's according to the British economist John Maynard Keynes. John Maynard Keynes. Keynes or Keynes? Keynes. Whatever. Let's stick with Keynes. Wait. Let me just research it. Na bother ako. Keynes. Also British. Keynes. Keynes. Sorry. Sorry, Paddy Keynes. Keynes. Nothing lasts forever. So the Bretton Woods system ended. Paano? Tignan natin. So in the early 1970s, however, the prices of the oil rose sharply as a result of the OAPEX, the Organization of Arab Petroleum Exporting Countries, imposition of an embargo. Ano yung embargo? Before natin ituloy yung sentence, let us take a look at what is embargo. So embargo is an official ban on trade or other commercial activity with a particular country. So bakit nga ba nag-impose ng embargo ang OAPEC or OPEC? So, tignan natin. In response to the decision of the United States and other countries to resupply the Israeli military with the needed arms during the Yom Kippur War. Ano naman yung Yom Kippur War? October 6, 1973, hoping to win back territory lost to Israel during the Arab-Israeli War, in 1967, Egyptian and Syrian forces launched a coordinated attack against Israel on Yom Kippur or the holiest day 
in the Jewish calendar. Oh, nagsupply kasi si United States ng United Arms in magkalaban ang Arab and Israeli military during that Yom Kippur War. Kaya inimpose ng OPEC. Eh, alam naman natin ang oil, without it, hindi magpa-function ng machineries. Of course, walang gas, di ba? Arab countries also use the embargo to stabilize their economies and grow. Correct me if I'm wrong, huh? It's like you're hoarding your resources for you to stabilize your own economy. I don't know if it has the same concept or not. The oil embargo affected the Western economies. Ano ulit yung embargo? Embargo is the prohibition, banning, proscription that were reliant on oil. To make the matter worse, the stock markets crashed in 1973 and 1974 after the U.S. stopped linking the dollar to gold, effectively ending the Bretton Woods system. As you can see the picture, wala ng gas, and of course, sa mga makinarya, sa mga industriya, they cannot function because oil is also a necessity. Ano yung naging repercussion? Ano yung naging consequence ng oil embargo na yan? You see how one nation can affect the global economy. Nakikita nyo yung talaga effect. Kaya nga nang sabi ni Marcus Aurelius in the Stoicism, what's bad for the hive is bad for the bees. So, we are all interconnected. Parang ganun din sa ating ekonomiya. If one nation prohibits the exportation of its goods, or services, maapektuhan ang buong ekonomiya. Tulad na lamang nitong oil embargo na nang nangyari noon that ended the Bretton Woods system. Ano, ano yung naging result? Ito, tignan natin yung naging result ha. Nagkaroon ng tinatawag nilang stagflation. Ito yung hindi na-predict ni Karen Keynes na magkakaroon pala ng stagflation. Di ba ang claim ni Keynes is that kakaroon ng crisis ang isang ekonomiya hindi dahil sa wala silang pera kundi dahil hindi napapaikot ito. Hindi ito nagagastos ng maayos or ng mabuti. Itong stagflation came from two words. Ano yan? Stagnation and inflation. So nagkaroon ng inflation, nagkaroon ng low gross domestic product or ano ba yung GDP and GNP? Tignan natin para ma-refresh lang yung utak nyo about GNP and GDP. Ang GNP, value of all goods and services made by a country's residents and business businesses regardless of production location. And ang GDP naman measures production inside of a country no matter who makes it. So, yan. Makikita nyo sa illustration. Maintindihan nyo na kagad. Higher rate of unemployment. Recession in most of the economic activities. And poor implementation of government policies. Magkakaroon ng stagnation kapag nag-decline ang economic growth and employment magkakaroon naman ng inflation kapag karoon na price hike or sharp increase in prices, stagnation and inflation. Let's talk about neoliberalism. When we say neo, it means new, right? Neolithic, recent or revived, modified. Modified liberalism. And if we are going to look at the dictionary, the meaning of liberalism states that willingness to respect or accept behavior or opinions different from one's own. Openness to new ideas. So new ideas, neoliberalism. Around this time, a new form of economic thinking was beginning to challenge the Keynesian orthodoxy. Economists such as Friedrich, <coughs> Friedrich, 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 Friedrich Hayek, and Friedman. Okay. Economists such as Friedrich Hayek and Milton Friedman argued that the government's practice of pouring money into their economies had caused inflation by increasing demand for goods without necessarily increasing supply. More profoundly, they argued that government intervention in economies distort the proper functioning of the market. Ano nga ba yung neoliberalism again? It is a political approach that favors free market, capitalism, deregulation, and reduction in government spending. So, new liberalism, acceptance of new ideas. So, ginamit nila itong economic turmoil na to, si Friedman, in order to introduce this, what we call neoliberalism. So, from the 1980s onward, neoliberalism became the codified strategy of the United States Treasury Department, the World Bank, the IMF, eventually, the World Trade Organization or the WTO, a new organization founded in 1995 to continue the tariff reduction under the GATT or GATT or the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trades. The policies they forward came in to be called the Washington Consensus. Ano nga ba yung Washington Consensus na yan? So, the Washington Consensus dominated global economic policies from the 1980s until the early 2000s. It advocates pushed for minimal government spending to reduce government debt. They also called for privatization of government-controlled services like water, power, communications, and transport believing that the free market can produce the best results. Free market, neoliberalism, para hindi tayo malito, dun na yun. Or nagkaroon na ng privatization of these government-controlled services. Finally, they pressured governments, particularly in the developing world, to reduce tariffs and open up their economies, arguing that it is the quickest way to progress. 
Advocates of the Washington Consensus considered that along the way, certain industries would be affected and die. And they call it or considered it as the shock therapy. And this shock therapy is considered essential or necessary for long economic growth. Nag-end yung Bretton Woods system and then nagkaroon ng Washington Consensus. Napunta naman tayo sa economic globalization today. The global financial crisis will take decades to resolve. Right now, we are in the pandemic situation. Mahihirapan talaga ang ating ekonomiya rin na bumangon kung sakali. And then, gaya nga nang sabi ko, with the help of these global actors like the IMF, they would step in if there will be a decline of our economy. They would help us. That's why it's very important that we are part of this what we call globalization process. The solution proposed by certain nationalist and leftist groups of closing national economies to world trade, however, will no longer work. Magiging protectionists nila. The world has become too integrated. Whatever one's opinion about Washington consensus, it is undeniable that some form of international trade remains essential for countries to develop in the contemporary world. Exports, not just the local selling of goods and services, make national economies grow at present. In the past, those that benefited the most from free trade were the advanced nations that were producing and selling industrial and agricultural goods. The United States, Japan, and member countries of the European Union were responsible for 65% of global exports, while the developing countries only accounted for 29%. When more countries open up their economies to take advantage of increased free trade, the shares of the percentage began to change. By 2011, developing countries like Philippines, India, China, Argentina, and Brazil accounted for 51% of global exports while the share of advanced nations, including the United States, had gone down to 45%. The WTO-led reduction of trade barriers known as trade liberalization has profoundly altered the dynamics of the global economy. So that's the present condition of our economic globalization. Pero, hindi sa lahat ng panahon at hindi sa lahat ng pagkakataon magiging fair. Everything is changing. Meron talaga at merong magiging unfair sa mga ganyong sitwasyon. And yet, economic globalization remains an uneven process with some countries, corporations, and individuals benefiting a lot more than others. The series of trade talks under WTO have led to unprecedented reduction in tariffs and other trade barriers, but these processes have often been unfair. O bakit daw unfair? Ito yung mga reasons kung bakit daw unfair ang economic globalization in today's condition. First, developed countries are often protectionists as they repeatedly refuse to lift policies that safeguard their primary products that could otherwise be overwhelmed by imports from the developing world. O meron naman talagang protectionist na country. They don't allow other nation or other countries to have trade with them. The best example of this double standard is Japan's determined refusal to allow rice imports into the country to protect its farming sector. Bakit daw? Ang justification ng Japanese is that rice is sacred. Ultimately, it is its economic muscle as the third largest economy that allows it to resist pressures to open its agricultural sectors. Another one, another example of this uneven process of economic globalization is that the United States likewise fiercely protects its sugar industry, forcing consumers and sugar-dependent business or businesses to pay higher prices instead of getting cheaper sugar from plantations of Central America. Faced with these blatantly protectionist measures from powerful countries and blocks, poorer countries can do very little to make economic globalization more just. Trade imbalances therefore characterize economic relations between developed and developing countries. The beneficiaries of global commerce have been mainly transnational corporations or yung tinatawag natin ng multinational corporations and not governments. And like any other business, these TNCs are concerned more with profits than with assisting the social programs of the governments hosting them. Personal interest. Host countries in turn using tax laws which prevents wages from rising while sacrificing social and environmental programs that protect the underprivileged members of their societies. The term race to the bottom refers to the countries or to countries lowering their labor standards, including the protection of workers, interests to hire in foreign investors seeking high profit margins at the lowest cost possible. Yun naman talaga eh. If you own a transnational corporation or multinational corporation, ano ba yung titignan mo? Of course, the low cost that would produce a high profit. So, 80-20 principle, Pareto's principle, like you're exerting 20% effort and producing 80% of the result. Diba? It's 80-20. That's how business works. That's how transnational corporations work. Governments weaken environmental laws to attract investors, creating fatal consequences on their ecological 
balance and depleting them of their finite resources like oil, coal, and minerals. Non-renewable resources natin. It is being compromised. So that's it for this video. I hope you learned something. You can just comment down below your questions about this topic. And if you have requests videos like this, just comment down below. Kapag luwag yung oras natin, gagawa ulit tayo ng videos ng ganito. Please share it to your classmates. Sharing is caring. And we must work as one in this pandemic era. That's the only thing that we could do. I mean, help one another. Giving is better than receiving. Iba yung satisfaction. This has been Clifford de la Cruz. And thank you for listening and finishing this video. I hope... You are all doing good and well. Stay safe. Bye.